I'm Mark Hanuel, Director of the Institute for the Humanities. Um, welcome to our anti-colonial screening of Stagecoach, an event organized and moderated by Emmanuel Ramos Barajas, who will introduce our speakers. Now I'd like to introduce the force behind today's event, Emmanuel Ramos Barajas. He is a scholar, curator, and educator who investigates the possession, commodification, and consumption of land in the cinema, art, and visual cultures of both Mexico and the US. He is the co-creator and video producer of Unsettling Journeys, an educational YouTube channel dedicated to deconstructing Latinx identities through art history, as well as the co-curator of the Borderless Cultures Film Festival organized through UT Austin. Currently, he is the communications media coordinator for the Block Museum of Art at Northwestern University. Previously, uh, he worked at the social media company, We Are Me Too, producing video content. He graduated from UCLA's School of Theater, Film and Television with a BA in Film and Interactive Digital Media. And he's currently completing an F MFA in the School of Art and Art History at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, thank you for organizing this, Emmanuel, and I will hand things over to you um, for the rest of our program and to do introductions for our speakers. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you so much for the opportunity to organize this through the Institute for the Humanities. I really appreciate it. Convention is the technology to decipher dreams. It is the equipment, all-terrain, four-wheel drive, designed to intrude on the dream world and extract the intangible. Its bounty, freshly minted, raw, unedited, and convoluted, needs rearticulation, for the fantastical exists without interpretation. Convention makes the phantasmagoric understood, legible to those who speak its language. Its translation into a beautiful image makes it sour and bitter. Compress its incoherence, convention is a shortcut to a feeling. Reset, see the world anew. Fresh eyes demand new ways to see, new thoughts to think. Exterior, Southwest, US, day. Fade in, a desolate land in desolate times. Superimposed, the time, is June 1880. John Ford's Stagecoach is a film about Yakima, a fractured, fragmented phantom. Yakima glides from scene to scene, disjointed and amorphous, often unseen, first appearing as an Inde woman, wife to Chris, a Mexican homesteader with a lot of information regarding last night's scrimmage between the Apache and the army. Even before we see her, we already know what to think of her. Savages, Mr. Peacock screams in fright, and then we take on his perspective, seeing what he sees, a native woman standing in the door frame. Though she does not react, Chris assuages us. She's a little bit savage, I think. Maybe not so bad to have Apache wife, eh? Apache don't bother me, I think. A few scenes later, in the dead of night, the vaqueros play guitar by the fire. And again, before we see her, we sense her. She fills the barren desert with her guttural voice as she harmonizes, puzzlingly, in perfect Spanish. The narrative halts, sojourning on a seemingly placid, picturesque instant, but a duplicitous one. Ahora, muchachos, váyanse she asserts soothingly between her sung verses, and the vaqueros continue to play, sliding towards the spare horses, jumping on and racing away into the dark horizon to the Apache warriors. Setting in motion her clandestine plot to get her revenge against her ungracious guests, who, upon first glance, have made up their mind that she is not one of them, that she is not human, Denied her humanity, she too steals away in the middle of the night, riding home to her people with Chris's shotgun and his favorite horse. Her inner world, 
however, we never see. I have made it all up. While Yakima, the Inde woman, is a character in the film, she is not the main character. She's a specter, a vision who complicates the plot a little bit and raises the stakes a lot. Don't believe, even for a second, that a classic Hollywood film told from the perspective of an indigenous woman planning a revenge against manifest destiny could have ever been made. Yakima is present to remind us that minoritized peoples are just in the way of the needs and desires of the white characters. Stagecoach really is about a group of nine Anglo strangers making a journey across a strange land. The real tension, a struggle for freedom, resides in white on white conflict. I am, after all, an unreliable narrator trying to convince you otherwise. The next time Yakima appears on the screen, it is as the stuntman Enos Edward Canut, nicknamed Yakima. At this point, the Apache have shown up and pursue the frantic passengers across the dry lake bay. Still a fracture, fran fragmented phantom, this Yakima stands in for Ringo, the actual main character, played by John Wayne, the star. Filmed in extreme long shots, that is, from quite a distance, Yakima as Wayne, as Ringo, jumps from the stagecoach onto the horses pulling it. He jumps row after row until he arrives to the leading horses. Here, the film cuts to a mid shot where Wayne has carefully replaced the stuntman. Thus, continuity is maintained and we, the audience, are none the wiser. This is convention the proper way of doing something, what is considered usual and correct. The illusion of continuity asks that from cut to cut, shot to shot, scene to scene, you never stop believing in what you've seen. Cut on action, match the island, establish the shot, reverse shot, genre is the standard formula for story. Chronological cause and effect give closure. Goal-oriented heroes give, inform us of new morals. The image conceals its two dimensions and dons mankind of its laurels. But be wary. This vision is nothing but dreams and shadows. These are the imperial rituals of spectacle. History reminds us not everyone is human. As art historian W.J.T. Mitchell calls it, the dream work of imperialism a distortion that expands all its energies in making itself invisible to solidify its myths as something real. It takes the fractures and makes foundation, the hand of a creator that erases all evidence of his existence, an unreliable narrator trying to persuade us otherwise. Realism to convince us of the world it has just built. Having spent the whole duration of the film so far, one hour, nine minutes, and seven seconds scaring us, but really scarring us with the fear of native attack, the Apache here, actually played by Diné actors, finally appear on screen. The native army charges on, the white characters extinguish their supplies of ammunition, and all seems lost. But at the last moment, the bugle signals the arrival of salvation. The charging cavalry brings the might of the empire to the salt flats. The original inhabitants of these lands, defending their rights, are chased away. This really is the climax of the film. But once the pursuit is over, the film is not. The conclusion of this battle, like Yakima the Inde's woman's escape, was never filmed. The Apache having literally been ran off the screen, the film's remaining 19 minute and 48 second runtime is reserved to settle the actual plot, revenge for a murdered brother, revealing the ideology of the film, and by extension, that of the director, the producer, the screenwriter, the stars, and the film industry as a whole. One where indigenous and minoritized people are nothing more than physical objects to expanding and securing the empire. These are the poetics of imperialism. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, violence begets violence and convention makes it understood. And so 
Before I continue to introduce our faculty guests and due to the poignant nature of our talk, um, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. What Stagecoach refuses to acknowledge, which nonetheless is evident, is that the cast is play traveling in circles around an area called Say Be in the Sky in current day Navajo Nation between what today is called Utah and Arizona. This sacred region was later renamed Monument Valley, and it is quite a distance from the Sonoran Desert where the story is supposed to take place. The need for convention, for a beautiful image and a beautiful set, has literally trapped the cast on a scenic celluloid loop route, a non-diegetic purgatory for convention's sake. And even then, the filming locations meander between the transcendent but inaccessible mesas and buttes of the Colorado Plateau and the Mojave Desert, a region near Hollywood and thus practical, even if not as majestic. However, the distinctive plant life of each space fractures the illusion of continuity, revealing the, mani revealing the manufactured nature of the dream we've already been convinced is real. Speaking today from Chicago, Illinois, and for the University of Illinois at Chicago, we need to recognize that this campus and the surrounding areas where we have made our homes lie on the traditional territories of the three fire peoples, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. The area was also a site of trading, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, including the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Inoka, Menominee, Sac, and Fox peoples. Decades of violent encroachment and colonization by European descendants are the context of the approximately 370 treaties made between the federal government and American Indian nations that were signed from 1778 and 1871. This does not include treaties that were never ratified or treaties signed when the US was still a British colony. Treaties become temporary pieces. There is more money to be obtained in the breaking than in the keeping of treaties. As such, treaties were designed to be broken. Following the Anglo War of eight, the Anglo-American War of 1812, where the United Kingdom and the United States lost no claims to land, but where indigenous nations were mostly displaced from theirs, the Council of Three Fires ceded to the United States government through the 1816 Treaty of St. Louis a strip of land 10 miles north and 10 miles south of the mouth of the Chicago River, extending the southwest directly to the Mississippi River. With the 1821 Treaty of Chicago, after two and a half years of open warfare and, and the defeat of a pan-Indian movement to keep settlers out of the Great Lakes region, representatives of the Council of the Three Fires signed a treaty giving up rights to la land in, the, in southwestern Michigan and giving permission to build a road from Detroit to Chicago. The 1833 Treaty of Chicago brought an estimated 3,000 traders, government officials, military troops, and land speculators to the small village to witness the ritualized imperial military proceedings where the Potawatomi ceded the last of their Illinois and Wisconsin's, Wisconsin lands, as well as their last reservations in Michigan. After this, some native groups began their dictated removal to lands west of the Mississippi River or fled to Wisconsin and Canada. What a history that focuses on treaty making refuses to acknowledge is that imperial struggles were not resolved with legislation. Not every native community left. Some chose to remain behind and keep fighting. Resistant movements continued even after native peoples quote unquote left. The subsequent minoritized groups arriving were met with similar conditions, as evident from the historic segregation and urban disinvestment practices employed by municipal, state, and federal governments, and the ongoing forced removal of low-income communities as a consequence of gentrification and urban reinvestment. These are not subsections of U.S. social histories. This is U.S. history. The situatedness of Chicago and the Midwest as an intermediate point, not just in a geographic or chronological sense, but also as an ideological one between the traditional mythic origin story of the US with the Mayflower and original 13 colonies and the conquest of the West and its entanglement of multiple empires. The freedom and rights we currently enjoy have come at the direct cost of indigenous communities, not just in this area. 
Our mobility has come as a direct result of the building of infrastructure and development transportation technologies. Any film or art that celebrates these accomplishments without mentioning the above is an incomplete history. As scholar Francisco Guevara reminds us the question, what does film do? And these are his answers. Film aids in the destruction of the environment. Convention is its tool. Film aids in the extermination of peoples. Convention is its tool. Film aids in the appropriation of labor. Convention is its tool. With this in mind, we need a new vision to watch films in which we do not bracket the problematic representation of minoritized people to focus, as traditional film history has done, on the technical achievements of the filmmaking craft. Along with acknowledging whose land we're on, we must also acknowledge the work the film has carried out in advancing the empire. Um, with this said, I would like now to transition and introduce our guests. Joining us today, we have Jeffrey Skalansky, specializing in intellectual and social history of capitalism in 18th and 19th century America. After graduating from the University of California at Berkeley and receiving his PhD in history from Columbia University, he taught at Oregon State University when he moved to, to the University of Illinois at Chicago. He offers courses on the history of imperialism, radicalism in America, and American intellectual history, among other topics. He is the author of two books, The Soul's Economy, Market Society, and Selfhood in American Thought, 1820 to 1920, which traces the fall of classical political economy and the rise of modern sociology, psychology, and allied social sciences in its place. Sovereign of the market, the money question in early America, examines the 200 year struggle of what should serve as money, who should control its creation and circulation and what principles should govern its role in the market relations. For potential graduate students, he is currently accepting new students in early American history, intellectual history, labor history and the history of capitalism. Our other guest today is um, Emmanuel Ortega, who received his PhD in art history from the University of Mexico. Um, Dr. Ortega is a Marilyn Thomas Scholar in Art of the Spanish Americas and Assistant Professor in Colonial Latin American Art at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His book project titled Visualizing Franciscan Anxiety and the Distortion of Native Resistance, The Domesticating Mission is now under contract with Rulich. Springing from his research interests, Dr. Ortega has curated in Mexico and the United States with a new exhibition titled Contemporary Ex Votos, Devotion Beyond Medium, which will open at the New Mexico State University Museum of Art in September of this year. Recent published works include an essay from June 2020, volume of the art bulletin titled The Mexican Picturesque and the Sentimental Nation, a study in 19th century land 19th century landscape and the sentimental fantasy of miscegenation, La Malinche and the popular imaginary, which will be published in the Denver Art Museum's exhibition catalog titled Trader Survivor Icon, the Legacy of La Malinche, opening in the spring of this year. He is a recurrent lecturer and a member of the board of directors of Arquetopia Foundation based in Mexico, Peru, and Italy, one of the largest artist residencies worldwide. So with that, I would like everybody to welcome our guest and transition into our conversation regarding stagecoach um, westerns and convention and its interlaced, interlaced history with history. Um, I think professors, my first question really is, um, what do you think of uh, Stagecoach, of John Ford's 1939 film, Stagecoach? Thanks uh, very much, Emmanuel, for the very kind uh, introduction. And I, it's really, it's exciting for me to do this uh, partly because I, I have, um, I, I bring so little expertise to it, I, I'm not, a fan of Western film or an expert on Western film, nor do I work on the American West. And I actually hadn't seen Stagecoach before, um, but I I was very struck by it um, in a number of ways that challenged what I was expecting for an iconic Western. And um, especially 
um, how you would use the word desolate, how, how desolate the vision seems to be. Um, and um, somehow I think I was picturing, you know, um, John Wayne charging, um, so a, a kind of triumphant, victorious movie. And this feels to me like a, a, a movie mostly about failure and defeat. So that, that was really striking. I hadn't seen the movie in a while. Um, and like, I feel, I think the first time I saw it, I was just looking for specific signs in relation to native history or the way that um, like First Nation peoples are registered in the screen by the early 20th century. But I realized that it's such a small part. So like the anxiety of the appearance and the attack um, of First Nation peoples is there throughout the whole entire movie, but we only get to see that almost like as a prelude to the performance of, of masculinity, you know? And, and it just reminds me of how, when it comes to our understanding of minoritized groups, it's always in relation to the anxiety brought forth by you know the the idea of of whiteness so i was really interested on that because i keep i keep watching the movie and it was halfway the movie and i still hadn't seen besides the first scene i still hadn't seen the presence of native americans so i think that was really interesting and after first speaking to you and jeff then i realized there were more nuances to the narrative than i first gave it credit for yeah, and I think what really is striking is that historically, Stagecoach is considered one of the early seminal Westerns. The Western genre had existed before, um, probably since the inception of Moving Image, um, but Westerns as we know them now didn't necessarily exist in the same, um, with the same status. Uh, Westerns were seen as kind of B films that you would maybe stay behind in the movie theater and watch after you watched the other spectacle that you were there to enjoy. Um, and what Stagecoach is credited with doing is that it establishes the Western genre as a primary genre in, in film history and film um, in, in the context of other film genres. And so to hear you have a type of confusion or apprehension to this particular film, because it is a Western, but it also doesn't fit into all the tropes that a typical Western would fit. So I think like that is particularly telling and, and it reminds, of, uh, reminds us of its position within you know, such an early Western history. Um, so I think going off on that and, and thinking about the conventions of, of filmmaking conventions and specifically the conventions of Westerns um, is that, uh, you know, a convention in its most basic definitions is the formula for making a specific kind of film. It is closely tied to genre, but genre and conventions kind of have, you know, um, different elements that exist within them. So I would want to ask each of you how you think that these conventions compare to what we imagine a Western to be. I mean, we already kind of talked about it, but let's get into it, into it a little bit more. What doesn't necessarily feel like a Western in this film? There were, there were two things that struck me about that. One that I guess does fit, which is that I, I gathered that Monument Valley, that John Ford kind of establishes John M Monument Valley as a vision of the West. So um, I was familiar with, as a historian, the picture of the West as um, a new world, you know, like um, F. Scott Fitzgerald called it a fresh green breast of the new world, a place of um, wildlife, um, uh, new opportunities, um, 
and this is a you know a young country this seems like a picture of a of a deathly place you know a, a boneyard and um, towered over by kind of natural ruins you know monuments to something gone and and um in that way, it, it felt to me very much of a piece with a certain darkness in the depression and a, a sense of um, a, uh, a failed West, a lost West, a kind of a, a, a dead, a, a dead Western ideal of um, escape, opportunity, equality, freedom. Um, uh, predicated on certain kind of racial order. Um, so that was one thing. The, the other thing that was notable to me convention-wise was that I, I pictured the Western as an action genre uh, and Westerners as, you know, laconic men of few words, but a lot of actions. But um, this movie is all talk. Uh, you know, all of the main events until, as you say, close to the end of the movie are um, conversations. And in a way, I guess you could think of it as a uh, reflection on or celebration of talk as a currency, just a decade after talkies kind of entered the main stream. Um, but it also made me think, you know, there's a line early on where the bartender says to Doc Boone, if talk was money, you'd be my best customer. And I was thinking, you know, on the one hand, for the cinema, talk was money at this point. It was their big new opportunity. But for these characters, um, talk is what they have instead of money. It's, it's what they exchange um, that's, uh, that really is transformative when they have, um, you know, it's, it's not a market. Um, it's, a, um, it's a conversation that, that changes them. So those things struck me convention-wise about the Western. I am always thinking in terms of painting convention. So one of the things that I'm attempting to do in my book project is to connect what I call the iconography of anxiety from the Spanish colonial perspective to the US imperial perspective in the 19th century and then how it has these manifestations in, in Western movies. I'm thinking of landscape convention more specifically. Um, as you quoted WJT Mitchell, um, landscape, it's something that we naturalize. We take it for granted. And that's precisely where its violence relies. The fact that we get to ignore it, that we don't actually pay attention, um, pay attention to it. But naturalizing something also erases um, violence. So when I think of when I think of the West, I always think of this space yes for freedom but always at the expense of another group which is kind of like the history of this the history of this country and the way that the landscape functions in this movie it allows for us to be distracted from other violences that are that are that are committed in the in the film so convention here allows for that for the destruction of that um, even the, the, the narrative of the story and how it unfolds allows also for that to be unfold. The beautiful picturesque scene with the Mexicans playing the guitar, um, like all, also that's another um, trope that has been around for like hundreds of years. And the way that it plays on, on the movie screen to me was really, um, really interesting. And ultimately, this idea of the middle of nowhere. So I'm always thinking of how we conceive throughout history, we have conceived the middle of nowhere as a desolate place until we find its potential for exploitation or development. Once we see that, then it changes. So when I think of the West, I think of its development, it maps how the West was just desert lands or how it was the site of the savage, apacherias, you know? But once you have this westward expansion, once you have Fremont, you know, overlooking the West and finding the land where they can establish this new, um, like 
white communities, then sort of it becomes this mythical place where freedom is allowed. So I'm always thinking of that and sort of like the convention of the picturesque, the convention of landscape, the convention of desert, sort of the aesthetics of the film distract us from this underlying ideology that has been at the forefront of empire making in the Americas, not only in the US, but in the Americas for 500 years. Yeah, so I think what we see immediately is that the convention of a particular genre or the convention of Westerns um, as entertainment quickly reveal ideology. Um, and it's not just, you know, a, a beautiful image on the beautiful mountains, but it is prescribing a future that when we look at these images, when we um, listen to these stories and we feel, um, when we empathize with the characters, immediately we are aligning ourselves with the vision of um, the ideology that the film is trying to present to us. And I think it's really interesting, Jeff, that you brought up the idea that the West is in this film conceived as a failed West, as a dead West, um, as a bone, boneyard, that those were your words. And I think something that I wanna pick up on this is that if you've been to the desert you come with this expectations of what you've seen in the film, um, but quickly you realize that the natural spaces that encompass the deserts of the West are so alive. <laughs> they are thriving with different kinds of, you know, species and ecosystems and connections. And it's just like this entire ecosystem that manifests itself. Um, just being there in a second. So I, what I find interesting in that is that if the only concept that you have of Western deserts is from Western films is that you would expect that the only life is cactus and harsh plants and rattlesnakes. Um, but aside from that, you're just treading along on this like dead land which is totally not the case. Um, and I find that particularly interesting. And that's another trope from the colonial period, sort of the ways in which, for instance, the Franciscans um, and like different mendicant orders as they arrive to Mexico and start expanding on, on to the North or what today is the Southwest, they start relying on description of landscape in relation also to its inhabitants. So they're dangerous, um, desolate spaces that allows for this dangerous barbarian peoples to live. So there's like a relationship that we have with the desert that it's intricately like linked to our understanding of the peoples that have lived in this area for, for, for thousands of years. And I'm also thinking of, again, thinking of ideology, the, the Western as a genre in literature, comes about the year, I think it's 1823, which is also the year when in Congress, the idea of the doctrine of discovery is passed. The land doesn't belong to that person that works it. The land now belongs to that who discovers it. And that's the same year where we get some of the first Western novels. And then from that, we have a dissemination in dime novels and then ultimately in, in film. So I think the 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 ideology has always been there, but it just comes to the forefront of popular imaginary and also like hegemonic institutions starting from the year um, 1823. I, I, I don't, I think that's not related to anything, but I just wanted to mention it because I was thinking about it and I forgot, um, I forgot earlier. Yeah, no, I do want to make connections to the colonial period, but I think before we move into that particular um, history, I would like to ask Jeff, um, being a scholar of money, um, money becomes a driving force in the film. Uh, money or lack of incites characters in the film to set out on a potentially dangerous journey. And so I would like to hear 
what you think are the associations created that money brings to this particular setting. In other words, how does money function in an area of the world that is far from the urban centers where money and its circulations are more controlled? And what narratives about modernity is this film envisioning for a land that is just becoming part of the cultural social um, fabric of the United States? Yeah, I, I was really um, surprised and struck by how, how conscious the movie is of um, monetary pressures and the way that money really figures as a, a force of oppression rather than opportunity. It's, it's pursuing these people West rather than, they're, they're, not, they're not prospectors. They're not, they're not pursu pursuing money. They're, in, they're united in flight. You know, Doc Boone can't pay the rent. Uh, Buck needs money to pay his, to uh, marry his Mexican girlfriend and wonders if he should charge half fare for the baby when she's born. And Hatfield has lost his place in Virginia landed society because of his debts. And Curly says he could use the $500 in gold from the reward money for capturing Ringo. Um, so it, uh, it really feels as if um, the movie is featuring the kind of um, haunting mirror images of um, consumer capitalism in a way, again, that felt very depression, you know, featuring addiction to alcohol, gambling, prostitution, corruption. And of course, you know, it starts with the arrival of the money on the coach they, they, and its workers' wages. It's the payroll of the mining company. And Gatewood, who steals the workers' wages, is um, he's the, the spokesperson for the promise of money. He's the one who says what's good for the banks is good for the country. He's the one who goes on the tirade on the coach about um, taxpayers aren't getting their money's worth and um, we need a businessman for president. He's the um, you know um, kind of depression era Trump figure um, in the movie and, um, and it's a uh, relentless, it's a devastating um, portrait of, of, um, of the failure of a vision of money as an as opportunity, you know, or markets as offering freedom and of the place, the West is a place, like I say, to strike it rich, um, cancel your debts. Um, so um, yeah, those things struck me. Yeah, and, and what I think is interesting is the fact that it feels like such a critique of capitalism, but at the same time, it's not renouncing that system. And what it makes me think is that this is just one particular example where the contemporary context in which um, the film was made really has implications as to how we look at the time period it depicts. Um, you know, like the the West became part of, became territories of the United States in the 1850s. So from the 1850s to the 1880s, when um, this film is taking place, not much time has gone by, you know? So I think like there's still, uh, in the popular imaginary at that time, there's this promise of boundless, boundless wealth creation. Um, you know, and I think that the landscape itself comes to represent how these ideologies play out. You know, the, the promise of wealth creation is just as boundless as the land itself. So if the land can be made to profit, the profits could be, you know, um, infinite. And so I think that that's like a very interesting way in which you know we have this convoluted um morphing of time periods the 1930s influencing the 1880s influencing the 1850s and just creating for us now a very 
seemingly straightforward representation of the West and the history of colonization. And um, I think it ties also with the, because the, 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 the script of Stagecoach Coach is based on a novel by Ernest Haycox mm -hmm. and another movie, Union Pacific, which came out right after Stagecoach, also based by a novel by um, the same author. So you, you can see sort of like these ideas of capitalism attached to the West but it seems like once they are adapted to the screen, there's there's a little bit of a different nuance that they are um, that they are dealing with. Yeah, um, and so I think my next question is just a large part of what made Stagecoach Stagecoach the icon is the location in which it was filmed. Monument Valley has come to be a symbol for the West itself, for the ideology that is. Um, taking place here. So how does the location help the film transcend? In other words, what is this landscape representation doing here? And how does this landscape representation, and what is it that this landscape representation choose to um, obscure or highlight? I was gonna mention that, that more than, more than what it shows us is what it erases. It erases Navajo nations. Um, it erases so many things in relation to the overall plot. But I'm thinking of this like grand vistas that were first promoted in painting, for instance, in the middle of the 19th century. And actually they function very similarly to Westerns. The way that some of these paintings would be exhibited, they will be publicized in newspapers. Um, there's a new landscape by Cole. There will be a new landscape by different artists in a specific gallery in New York. So there will be a curtain and then they will open the curtain. Then you have this grand vista of the West that will be revealed. So sort of again, the promised land um, and the, the, the vastness that will lead to, towards, towards, um, towards the future of, of, the, of the empire. So it's very interesting how we keep getting the same vista. <laughs> to me in the whole movie, they just go around in circles <laughs> in, in Monument Valley, but they're able to capture this, 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 um, this different vastness. Of this, of this space, but I think more than anything is that is the erasure of, um, of Diné, of Navajo nations. And it's very interesting because I don't know if much has been written about it, but I know for instance, the relationship that Navajo peoples have to the movie, it's complicated. I mean, you go to Monument Valley, we were there a couple of years ago and they, there was a sense of, um, from what we um, gather that, they, they, they were proud of it, you know, like they have family members that work as extras in the movies, but yet there's also this, this violence uh, of, the actual, of the actual film. So some of those are sort of the things that, that no matter how well the convention of landscape is applied cannot, you know, it just, we don't see it. Um. <laughs> As I say, I, I'm, I haven't seen many Westerns um, and it, um, they, the movie did make me think of two movies in proximity to it that I had seen, Wizard of Oz, which came out the same year, and Grapes of Wrath. And they're, in terms of the landscape, they're both um, road trips and, you know, they're, they're um, the relationship of those movies to Kansas and to Oklahoma and Route 66 um, reminded me of the desolation of this of this uh, vision of the West. I mean, the stagecoach seemed to me like that the house that goes up in the tornado, you know, with Dorothy, or like the um, uh, the beat up uh, jalopy that the Jode family drives along Route 66. It's, um, you know, it's a little storm tossed crucible for, and, and um, all of the characters are outcasts, 
fugitives, outlaws. They're all homeless. Several of them are, we know specifically that they've lost their families like Ringo Kidd and Dallas says, I think she lost her parents in a massacre on Superstition Mountain. And um, uh, it, it, so it, it, the, the landscape um, was resonant to me of those refugee road trips. And then the other thing that it made me think of it being in the Southwest was um, the Civil War that, you know, this is um, the Union troops have re been redeployed um, to the Southwest. And it, it seemed to me like the movie is, is looking to not just the West, but the South as, um, alternate Americas um, that are failed here. One, a kind of vision of order, hierarchy, inequality, community, stability, tradition, slavery. Another, you know, a vision of freedom, equality, individualism, both predicated on a kind of racial um, order, on co colonialism on slavery and um, both failing here. And the movie does seem uh, quite explicitly concerned with that it's on a kind of ruins of the civil war. I mean, the scene where Hatfield is wandering through the burned ruins and covers the woman, the dead woman really reminded me of Georgia burning and gone with the wind, which came out the same year. And, you know, I think John Ford made young, young Mr. Lincoln the same year. And there's a lot of references to the fact that Doc, Doc Boone and his friend Sergeant Billy served in the Union Army and Hatfield and Mallory, uh, Mallory's dad were in the same Confederate regiment. So it f feels to me like um, a, it is a wrestling with failure of a certain promise of uh, for white men of freedom and mastery or different promises, a Southern promise, a Western promise, both, uh, you know, kind of in ashes um, in 1939. And um, I don't find that the movie pulls much out of those ashes. I, you know, I, I, what, the, the, in the end, um, uh, well, in the end, of course, they had, they light out for the ter they had, head to Mexico, but um, uh, so that so all of those things um, surprised me. Yeah, no, I think that that's totally the case in in the sense that we talked about this, and is that the film is about failure. It's it you know, and this is resonant with. Um, the the Great Depression, but the fact that the two most likable characters, the two characters that are probably going to do the best job in expanding the empire and protecting it, which is Ringo, the escaped convict, and Dallas, the sex worker, um, they ultimately flee to Mexico. You know, like the film is supposed to be a redemption or, or to imagine the futures of, of the greatness of, of the US, particularly in the West. Um, but because of their personal histories, it's just easier to escape social roles and conventions by just going to another country, which I think sends a somewhat mixed signal. And, you know, this might just have been part of the censors, um, you know, just kind of having to work around the fact that John Wayne kills three brothers and that uh, the sex worker, while she has a heart of gold, does not necessarily pay the price for her previous sins, you know? So I think like their happy ending just has to be outside this nation, um, which I think is really interesting. And, and what I like about, you know, your connections to the Civil War, which I feel are very poignant, is the fact that um, obviously the Civil War as a, you know, as a, as a moment in history 
creates such a rupture between, between North and South. Um, but, you know, and you can make the argument that that rupture has not healed and that it's still present. Um, but what I think is interesting is that immediately following the Civil War, the way in which um, an attempt at healing happened was with wars with the Plain Indians. So, you know, it didn't matter. I mean, it probably did matter if you fought for the North and the South, but when there was a new goal in advancing the empire and pushing forth and going westward, you could work together. And obviously that came at the expense and genocide of indigenous peoples in the Great Plains. And, and no, that's what I was going to mention that one of the things that this landscape is doing is maybe this movie will like portrays the idea of the failed promise, but it instills in the popular imaginary that there's always more beyond the West, that there's always the idea of keep expanding. There's always the idea of keep moving. So it's almost like regardless of what the intentions of the filmmakers or what the actually movie is portraying, it creates this sort of like mythical space in film that gets repeated over and over and over and over again. And I think part of its violence resides not, not, not so much maybe in this movie, but in its life afterwards, in the sort of like the, the promise of expansion, the promise of removing for expansion as articulated with the convention of the vastness of the landscape. It's really like the, in its most and earliest successful iterations in film here. And then it just like gets repeated over and over and over and over again. So like to your question, what landscape is doing, it's that it's the, but maybe here it's more about broken, uh, unfulfilled promises. The, the idea of ultimately the promise is Mexico, you know, but, but it's, it, it, it established a formula that, that ultimately created a lot of, a lot of, did a lot of danger, a lot of damage. Yeah. And so well, I think, oh, sorry. yeah, Gilcha? I was just gonna say that your mention of war um, made me think that I think war in the movie is, is an object of nostalgia. It's, um, I think the, the, you know, that um, the kind of uh, quasi marriage, you know, with stones as confetti at the end is like a kind of decisive, it's, a, it's like a decisive exchange of gunfire. You, you're supposed to, there, there's some, um, I think there's something in the melodramatic genre that's, that yearns for a resolution of the conflicts through these decisive, you know, um, man to man or man and woman exchanges. But, um, you know, I, it's tr I, 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 I agree very much with what Emmanuel Ortega was saying about the, uh, the, the, kind of, the kind of hopeful, happy ending, uh, being of some significance, but it, it did feel to me like given the scope of the problem that the movie presents us with, which is much bigger than these two individuals, the answer that they could, you know, they could leave. And I think, um, what does uh, the marshal say? They're, they'll be free from the benefits of civilization. It's a it's a fairly meek um, resolution to, you know, the conflicts that have left Hatfield dead, and you know, other people, the the play the the, the it's uh, well, you see you see what I'm saying. I, I, I don't think the movie really f tries to resolve the bigger social yeah. crisis that it contains with um, its own. Yeah. Ending. Yeah, and I think that that's the interesting part because the film set out, the premise of the film really is um, people of different social classes are stuck together in a stagecoach and have to work together to survive. You know, that's kind of like the plot in a nutshell. 
Um, and where the film does make a lot of, reserves a lot of time to explore these social differences and um, discrimination against certain groups while ignoring completely discrimination against others, other groups, um, it, it doesn't resolve it. it. And, you know, I think that that's the, the interesting part is that whereas the film really tries to tackle you know, contemporary, at least for 1939, issues of wealth disparity and class inequality, it doesn't give us something as that is a solution. And I think that is telling because a solution would be a critique of capitalism, which neither the industry, the film industry as a whole, nor this particular film would try, you know, considering the fact that a couple of years later, you know, like maybe 10, 20 years later, you would have the Red Scare and Scare and McCarthyism happening. So I think like the ideology can only be the one that is state sanctioned and the film industry to prevent um, interference from the federal government actively censored itself. So I think it's it is an interesting part because when we look at these films that are historical in nature, that tell us of history, that are very um, clearly engraven, superimposed with like June 1820, like we know the specific month, we know the specific date, it's situated in the past, it has a historical context, and yet there is an interweaving of text and meta text and context that really influences how history is portrayed. And I think that that is something that, um, you know, is not just specific to this particular film, but is inherent to film as a medium. And I think that that deserves to be interrogated. Like how is history being constructed and reconstructed? Um, I have a comment for all of our audience members. If you would like to start thinking of questions or if you do have a question, please drop it in the chat. We'll begin looking at these questions in maybe 10 minutes. Um, and I think this brings me to um, Hollywood as an entity, you know, 1930 year, 19, <laughs> 1939 is considered the golden year of Hollywood. Multiple films were made in this year um, that have entered the cinematic canon. Films like Gone with the Wind, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, The Wizard of Oz, Gunga Din, The Women, and Stagecoach make up just a small number of these films. Um, so, what I'm interested in now is how this narrative of Hollywood's best year helps obfuscate the social issues that were happening instead, instead opting for a story of success. We're celebrating, you know, like film in its greatest, um, in its greatest year because the form has really taken on so much girth, you know, considering that 10 years before sound was introduced, um, 20 years before that film was still like nascent and then you arrived to 1930 before World War II um, and film is like strong, you know, in, in the terms of how it's made in the technologies in the industry that develop around it. Um, so what I'm wondering is what other periods throughout history repeat this pattern like focusing on certain periods of histories as successes rather than contextualized as just moments in time where technical achievements happened? I think, I think it's similar to convention, right? When we talk about this movie, we talk about the stunts. When we talk about this movie, we talk about the landscape. So we sort of like, um, there's like the famous close-up shot um, when John Wayne is first introduced into the screen. Like I've been, like I, there's entire essays just on that close-up, right? So it's 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 almost like we we get stuck on convention, and and that allows us to to be distracted for other things. I, for instance, in in my scholarship, I, I'm always um, talking about the ways in which the tools of the Renaissance, for instance 
in the Americas were used for spiritual conversion. So when you think about one point perspective, when you think about all of the sort of like the tools that we learn in, in art history 101 and the ways in which it developed like a new conception of art in relation with science and that created the Renaissance with the capital art, et cetera, et cetera. Once they are seen in relation to colonization, we need to change the conversation, but because we are stuck with convention, because we are stuck with formalism, we're not allowed to go beyond that. So like the violences of the Renaissance are rarely um, in terms specifically of art and the convention of art and the tools of art are rarely, um, are rarely mentioned. So we have to think about it in, in, different, in different terms. So I feel like that's exactly what's happening when a canon of any kind in any period of any genre and any medium is established that can and more than uplifting a series of objects or movies or, or buildings or whatever, it's downplaying so much more. And I think that's precisely what 1939 is doing. I mean, and and that's, that's something that I was reminded by um, my advisor. She always talks about how Hollywood's answer to crisis around the world is always a movie. So sort of they erase the violence of World War II by, by just amplifying the, the dream of Wizard of Oz. And if you think about World War II and when you think about 1939, then you see sort of like the ways in which we were distracted, the lens in which Hollywood went, so we will be distracted on, on what was happening in Europe. And there's examples, there's, 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 there's pieces in relation to La La Land, and the election of 2016. And I mean, and, and you can make connections to so many movies and what Hollywood does in relation to, again, to, um, to, to violent, you know, like historical movies yeah. in the US. I think your comment just makes us think that we should always be wary of Technicolor. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, Technicolor. And, and, and I think that that's, you know, part of, the question that I'm asking, which is um, the idea of technical developments, the, the, the narrative that celebrates the development of technologies, of techniques, of convention, ultimately creates a hyper meta narrative that is much more, um, that is reductionary, that it's, you know, that it just reduces and distills to just a single thread as opposed to considering um, the, you know, the breadth of human history. I think that that's very interesting. Um, Jeff, would you like to add anything to that? Just two things that, you, that uh, your question and Emmanuel's response were making me think of. One is about how it's something that I often say to my students that um, we look back and we say that something was the beginning of something, but at any given moment, people um, can't have that, that, that can't have that awareness. They're looking back too. And, you know, um, it seems to me that Stagecoach is looking back not forward, like Gone with the Wind or Young Mr. Lincoln or Grapes of Wrath. Those, those movies are looking back and then that we see them, like you said, as the genesis, as the, as the birth of, for example, mainstream uh, A Westerns is distorting. And, and the other thing that I think is distorting about it is that we, um, we attribute a single um, vi forward-looking vision um, to the origin rather than seeing the instability. And, I, and to me, the, um, like I say, the, 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 it's, it's the subsequent history of the Western that, that fooled me in terms of what I was expecting and, and seeing this one and in thinking uh, the same person, why would the same person who makes this movie make Grapes of Wrath the very next year? What, what's the ideology that, there? That it's, the ideology is complex and unstable. And it seemed to me the movies are 
too. And in that way, I think that's a, a continual, continual story in terms of American culture. Yeah, and I think that's precisely the, the very interesting part of thinking about historiography and film in that film, aside from just telling the history of the past, has other agendas, which is it has to sell, it has to be attractive to audiences, it has to create a neat um, narrative that has a beginning, middle, and end. It has to end, it has to have a closure and conclusion, and you just end up with a version of the history that it's trying to depict as opposed to the history that it's depicting. And, and in relation to both Jeff's and your comment, this is a movie that, that's on, that stands on hundreds of movies that depict Native Americans in negative ways, hundreds of them. This is a movie that stands on over a century of Western novels. So like that, the, sort of like the convention is already there, but portraying it in this grand way, sort of move it into a, into a different direction. But I, I, I really, I agree with you, Jeff, this idea of just looking at the past. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so prevalent. Yeah, I think, you know, we haven't even talked about The Searchers, which is probably the more egregious example of representation. But instead of doing that, um, Mark, I think you had a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been so wonderful and just brilliant to have the conversation about these issues that are adjacent to the film in order to open it up. Um, it's just utterly fantastic. I was wondering what people's thoughts were about some of the visual language of the film, particularly in relation to the female characters, um, um, and particularly, and, and just connecting that to the ideology of the film as you're talking about it. Um, and this is sort of connected, I, I think, to maybe the ways in which Jeff was suggesting that there is a kind of critical potential built into the film, even amid its exclusions. Um, and I guess I was thinking about the way that Yakima is presented in the close-ups in a way that connects her with Dallas and um, um, particularly their exclusion from proper domesticity and proper sexual reproductivity. You know, you go on down the line, the common ground of these characters and also um, their, the, the locus of those characters in the visual pleasure of the film. You know, um, those shots have a certain kind of sort of talismanic erotic authority to them. Um, and so, you know, the connection of those characters, which is also allegorically connected in the film in terms of, you know, exclusion, you know, the, the Don Wayne and, um, and the, and Dallas plot, the, you know, it is, it, I don't look at, at, at it as redemptive, but rather as, you know, an allegory of exclusion, incarceration, and, um, you know, that as you point out, they, they have to leave. Um, and that, you know, mirroring a kind of, um, um, you know, um, cost of Western expansion that's allegorized at the level of the plot about white people. And so I guess, you know, yeah, what are people's thoughts about these um, visual languages of the film that also ideologically connect the white characters with the Native American characters? Yeah, I think uh, to begin to start us off, I think uh, the convention of, you know, the classic Hollywood language of storytelling is one that ultimately dictates to this day how we expect films to look. And this is my, my, my talk on continuity and in invisible editing is where this stems from, is that um, continuity editing expects that 
or edits the footage in a way that each cut is invisible, that you don't notice it, that it's not jarring, and that um, you and that you keep that you are left inside the cinematic space, just looking at the story, taking it in, um, and a large part of that language is, you know, the objectification of women as objects and objects to be looked at and to be observed. Um, and a particularly interesting and maybe ironic comparison that I have in mind is the fact that the film is expending all of its energies in pairing John Wayne with um, the uh, Dallas character. They are the perfect pair to make more imperial subjects. You know, their kids are going to belong to the empire and they're going to make the empire stronger. Um, and what I think is ironic about this is that John Wayne in real life was married to three different women and they were all Hispanic or Latina, you know? And the point of comparison here is that there's two interracial relationships in the film. One of them is the stagecoach driver who talks about his Mexican girl and how he's stuck feeding a bunch of like members of her family because her family is so large. And this is played to com comedic effect. The second interracial relationship is that of Chris and Yakima. And Yakima ultimately leaves Chris in this kind of disregard for whatever their marriage contract could have been. Um, and so off screen uh, in the real world, you have just John Wayne married to Latina women in a way that would never have been visualized as like a real serious relationship in classic Hollywood. Um, and to me, this is like a fascinating point to emphasize because, you know, we enter into conversations about like colonization and sexual violence and all of these things. Um, and so uh, when you make the comparison of Yakima and, and the Dallas character, I think certainly that there is a lot there that needs to be explored. Um, so this is just, you know, the surface of that. I think, and this also goes to Laura's question, I think the constitution of whiteness depends on, on, on these stereotypes. I'm thinking of a wonderful book by Reginald Horseman, Race and Manifest Destiny, and sort of like the constitution of whiteness um, in the 1840s depended on the monstrosity, the constructed monstrosity of Mexicans in the Southwest, and sort of like the there's so much information was widespread throughout the United States talking about um, Mexicans as lazy, Mexicans as um, retrograde, and all of that is just again echoes from England and France and Germany talking smack about the Spanish being backwards. You know they have the Inquisition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But whiteness is constituted, it's more specifically straight male whiteness in the movies is constituted through the domesticity of women is constituted through the savage the, the savageness or you know i don't know if that's a word but it's now of of like native peoples it's constituted by the deceiving conniving like native women um, and so on and so on so you in order to be able to amplify it this like the masculinity of like the white masculinity of John Wayne, it's dependent on on all of those characters, but also the anxiety, the anxiety of attack of indigenous people, the anxiety of miscegenation between Mexicans and Native Americans. So like I think all of these things that surround this um, this couple that we're talking about, at ultimately what they're doing is they're. Um, allowing, as Laura was saying, allowing for the redemption of this, of this white couple. Jeff, would you like to add anything? Um, just, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, Mark's question really is provocative to me in terms of the, the, the visual 
imagery, it, 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 it did seem to me that um, both um, Dallas, Claire Trevor, she's the, she's the big star in the movie at the time. And uh, I could see why in that the movie, um, there's a lot that happens with her just with the camera watching her right right from the beginning she's her identity is un, is shifting right in front of you and that's true for yakima also that i thought that, that um the camera allows um there's it's it's it stays with the the two women and allows them to show they say i think a certain kind of instability of identity that I, I thought the movie is interested in more generally that you know that there's a certain I, kind of melodramatic ideal that you strip away the false front and you get to the true identity but in, in this case um, Hatfield, Doc Boone, um, Dallas, Yakima the, the, these are characters I, I think that there, where there's a lot of play, you know, but um, moving back and uh, back and forth. And, um, and partly I had the sense of the mo John Ford and the cinematographer um, allowing that to happen in a visual way that's not in the script too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think speaking of melodrama, it's, you know, the, the, the connections between melodrama and domesticity and how, you know, we, when we think of melodrama, we might think of Douglas Sirk and the lush Technicolor um, melodramas over the top. Um, but I think that there's so much to, to explore here as well, where melodrama ultimately comes down to um, Dallas, the character supplicating to John Wayne, like, if we are going to live together, like just ignore these questions of honor and pride and like be alive with me and live with me. Um, and so I think like that's an interesting point of comparison to the ways in which, um, you know, domesticity and melodrama go hand in hand. Um, but I would like to tackle Deborah Stratman's question um, just asking for our thoughts uh, in regards to genre as colonizer and seeing as we are near the end of our program um, and this program is about convention and genre and formula, I think there is a very telling example in historian Peter Yakavone's article, uh, Free from the uh, I forget the title of the article, but he talks about how, and I'll share it later. Um, he talks about how Indian attack sequences contributed to the success of the genre. So a very particular, just one movie was the first to initiate um, the trope of like the native attack surrounding um, either the fort or the stagecoach. And these types of sequences became so successful that the system just demanded that they be included. And I think that this particular film, Stagecoach, is a perfect example of that. If we're making a Western, it has to have an Indian attack. The Indian attack is there, but it doesn't transcend beyond like a physical, visceral experience it just adds to the spectacle of, of of the genre and i think that that is a perfect way to connect genre to the idea of colonizing and colonizer um the trope the formula demands that you do this so you do it and i think um this is something that is just visible across multiple genres, you know, the tropes. When you make a, as a student of filmmaking, you wanna make a, a film noir, like you know what tropes to recur to. And I think like, that's the interesting part where parody can also come in and show us the ways in which we've normalized this ideology. And I think it's also, um, speaking of, the um the coloniality <laughs> of genre it's that it's that there's 
that's that's what's the that's what's the danger of film for me that it solidifies sort of like hundreds of years of some of these tropes into something that is attractive, something that makes sense, something that we can see, something that we can see in in um in motion, the the trope of 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 native attacks, the trope of the smoke of war, um, the trope of um, natives coming from the mountain. I mean, that, go, that goes back to like 1493, like the 1500s and the ways in which they have been passed on. And what I always tell my students is that the ideology and the genre and the convention, it's the same. The technology is what changes. So, but once again, and this is from um, Benjamin, like, so Walter Benjamin, so once you see sort of those genres into actual moving images, the myth, it, it's solidified more than ever. So what has been in construction for 400 years becomes a reality, a palpable reality that you see in front of you um, through, the, through the conventions and through the genre of, of, of cinema. And I think with this, we just have our final thoughts, which is film and the telling of history is complicated and um, a lot more work needs to go into, into how we think of history and the way that film and moving images have contributed to the telling of history, especially considering now that we have um, you know, television and newscast and images are constantly uh, being bombarded into our retina. So I think now more than ever, a visual literacy um, is important, not, not just in terms of the technologies that are employed, but also the historical development of tropes, um, conventions, genres, Etc. And I think before we head out, I would really just like uh, to give the opportunity to our, well, first, thank you both for an interesting and riveting conversation. I really appreciate your help. Um, but aside from that, I would love to give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit about the classes that you're teaching this semester, what you plan on teaching next semester, and, uh, you know, how in students who are interested in the topics that you study um, can get in touch with you. Well, I'll just say quickly, I, I'm teaching a course uh, right now on the history of the woods and forest, um, and then a graduate course in the history of property. And then in the fall, I'm gonna be teaching an undergraduate course, which is an early American intellectual history and then a graduate course sort of for first year American history students, but students can certainly get in touch with me by, um, by email at my faculty uh, web address and I'd be really grateful to hear from them. And um, Emmanuel Ramos Barra, I'd, I'd be glad to hear a little bit more too, uh, if, you, if you have a couple of minutes to say more about how this event fits into the, um, your sort of bigger vision for what you're doing with films beyond Stagecoach. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, no, I'm just teaching, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly moving into more of museum studies. So I'm teaching a class in relation to the exhibition that opens at New Mexico State University, September 30th, Contemporary Ex Votos. Um, I'm also um, teaching my 263 class, 263, which is the history of Latin American colonial um, art. And next semester, I'm doing an introduction to the history of museums 180. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, uh, I think this project that I'm envisioning of, of film screenings really is trying to think about film, imaging technologies, history, colonization, um, and you know the interlaced network between all of these different contexts. Um, I think my primary idea is to change the way in which we look at film. I think we are in a period of time where, um, you know, we're, we're reckoning culturally what to do with all these older classic Hollywood films. And there's been multiple attempts by different institutions to address this. 
Um, and I think the one possible way to approach it is just to change our relationship to the screen. Um, I want to imagine a different type of space where you go watch a movie and the lights don't necessarily dim, that you don't necessarily have to be quiet and just sit there and watch there, um, but really in which um, it becomes a discussion first screening rather than a seeing first screening. Um, so that's kind of my, my goals and my objectives with, with this screening project. Um, thank you for asking about that. I'm very excited and I hope to keep uh, pushing forward with this. Um, so I think that said, I wanna thank everybody who joined us today and who contributed by asking questions and in the chat, uh, we really appreciate it. Um, please stay in touch. If you wanna reach out to any of us, I'm sure we would all be happy to keep the conversation going via email. And with that said, I would like to thank the Institute for the Humanities one more time, Mark and Linda. Um, thank you so much for your support and your help and the opportunity to present this conversation. Thank you for this fantastic program. Thank you, Emmanuel Ortega and Jeff Sklansky. This has been a great conversation. And um, I look forward to more of these. Um, and I'd love to talk about this vision that you have of screening and how we could do um, you, you know, an experiment with um, modes of screening a film and combining conversation with it. Looking forward to it. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, so you Mark. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks very much for including me. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Jeff. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.